Hello, I'm Brendan Howell, and today I'm going to talk about teaching graphic design foundations using free Libra and open source software. So the title I came up with uh, is this kind of fancy word, praxeology. I um, hope it's not too pretentious, but it's a kind of a nice word. So let me, let's just see what the dictionary says it means. They say that Praxeology is the dedu deductive study of purposeful human action and conduct. Sounds good. So it's very reflective, I think, for people learning to use new tools and exploring the possibilities of new media. That sounds like a good approach. So I thought that was a, a nice word to frame things. And I gave it this subtitle, though, uh, about how I'm getting away with teaching this subject using software that's maybe not the officially sanctioned tool. And um, I guess the reason I say that, some people might say, well, it's a bit negative or it's a bit or at least uncertain. And I think that comes from my own experience that when I suggest sometimes to people that they try using something that's a bit outside the mainstream, maybe, or at least unconventional, uh, that people get a bit skeptical, sometimes even hostile. So I was kind of surprised and quite pleasantly surprised that it's it's been working out pretty well. So I'm going to share some of the successes and um, some of the ideas and approaches and things. Well, there's some failures too, but for the most part, the, talk about the positive aspects of how well this is, has been working for me. So in 2015, someone approached me and asked if I wanted to teach temporarily for a year uh, in Brunswick or Braunschweig, Germany, at the uh, University of Arts there. Now this is the, it's maybe not as famous as some of the other schools, but it is the second biggest art school in Germany. And it has a very, uh, like a classic fine arts basis. It's not, it's not coming from the more industrial applied arts, it's coming from a fine arts tradition. So uh, they wanted someone who, in my case, I said, well, are you sure you want me? I'm not a proper, I'm not a graphic designer. And they said, no, no, we want, uh, for the foundations year, it's important, even though in my department is visual communication, it's important that we start with this fine arts tradition, both for the digital and for the analog uh, techniques. And so uh, my, my colleague, uh, she teaches the, the more analog foundations, and I teach the digital. Of course, we have a lot of overlap, we do projects together, but uh, we both are coming from arts traditions and or also some technical things. In my case, I studied engineering, did my first degree in that, and then my second degree was in fine arts. So um, I, I told them, yeah, I'm not a designer, and they said, no, we, we don't want some agency, Heinz coming in and, and limiting the, the ideas too early. Later on in, in other coursework, of course, they will do things that are more applied. But initially, we want them to have this fine arts tradition and a wide base of, of possibilities and aesthetic practices. So I said, okay. And then I said, but the other thing, the other stipulation I have is I want to do this with with floss software and they said hmm, okay sure uh, and they were basically unhappy with the uh, the situation they felt that things had become a bit uh, a bit stayed in the last few years in terms of software and that uh, uh, also that the licensing situation had changed and people weren't so excited about the the conventional tools that have been frankly, more or less the same. I mean, they've been updated, but they haven't changed dramatically in about 25 years. So they were interested in, in what I had to offer. So I was sort of skeptical after our meeting, 
But then they called me back and said, okay, you've got the job. And I said, well, okay, then I need to come up with a curriculum. I need to come up with some way of uh, taking all this software that I talked about and, and making it fit into this particular, in this case, we had a module description. So I had some requirements, even though they gave me a certain carte blanche in terms of the, the details. So the four main areas of the course are the following. Pixels and lines. I stole this from some people who've in the past been involved with the Libre Graphics meeting. hope they don't mind. I'm pretty sure it's all right. Pixels and lines are sort of, especially for 2D, which is mostly what the, the stuff we're doing is 2D, are the main uh, ways of representing images in the computer. So we've got raster-based images and vector-based images. And um, yeah, I'll get more into how we deal with that later. The second major topic area is reading and writing machines. So text and typography, but also the idea of how we work with text, how we write, how we read. So that also touches on a lot of areas of interaction and, well, how we tell stories, narratives. The next topic area is camera vision. And again, this is one where it's not just photography or photography and film. We get into animation. And then, of course, things have gotten kind of weird with photography lately and pretty interesting. So there are a lot of new possibilities, new ways of uh, what some people have called non-human photography and uh, some new ways of, of seeing that involve the computer sort of doing the looking for us. And so we play with things like sensors, image processing, um, you know, some even a little bit of, of AI. We need to at least be aware of what's going on there, even if we're not going to get deep into the, the actual algorithms. And then the last topic area is what I call meta machines. So that would be programming, of course, but also uh, anything that's very dynamic. So if you're dealing with something that's interactive, uh, whether it's web or um, applications, but also the, the other thing, and this is another one that's sort of started to change a lot, that if, you know, one of the criticisms that I have of these more conventional conservative tools is that they are based on an old idea. They're sort of imitating the old analog way of producing, that you make an image and you go into the dark room and you enlarge it and then you do all these things more or less by hand. And you do those, of course, now with a screen and a mouse, but you're still doing these individual operations manually. Sometimes that's good and great, but Sometimes it might be more interesting, and this is where designers, some designers, are starting to think about things in terms of generating images, so that you design a machine, and then you put some input or some data or some triggers, which then output an image based on a system of rules and algorithms that the designer has developed. So this is another way of where I'm talking about meta-machines. So now at the same time, we need to maybe look at some actual concrete examples. Like what, what are we actually doing here? And uh, I talk about pixels and lines, but one of the things we're doing is we actually, well, maybe it's a bit mean of me, but I actually start off by having everyone install a text editor because I want to deal with media, not applications. I love certain applications, and I think that's great. But I think the later you start with them, the more uh, open your mind is to other possibilities and ways of, of doing things with a particular medium. So we're working with pixels and lines, but we start off by using a text editor to make uh, pix maps and bitmaps manually. It's a bit maybe a little bit cruel, it's, it's certainly labor-intensive, but we just do a, some brief assignments initially 
where before we start working with the mouse and the GUI and all those nice, cool features that the software gives us, we do it by hand and we actually see what those pixels really are as data and we think about it in a different way. And the same with SVG. We make SVG vector graphics by hand. We code them by hand. And of course, that means that a lot of things that are really easy in, say, Inkscape are nearly impossible. So it actually is an interesting set of aesthetic constraints. And the students start to sometimes develop, uh, at least within the context of these assignments, some really cool minimalist aesthetics and approaches and the images they make, and they start to see this themselves, the images they make are different than the ones that they would make when they're presented with the, the convenient access to more advanced techniques. So next, we then start using the GUI. So we use graphical tools, but these are not the tools that are the conventional ones that you find in professional design agencies. We're using well, some of them are, but they're not as widespread. They're not the market leaders, so to speak. So GIMP, Krita, Inkscape, things like that. And part of the point of this is not necessarily to say that this is better or this is, it's more to say that there are a lot of different ways to work with, say, vector graphics, and there are different programs, and each program has its own idiosyncrasies, its own advantages, its own tricks, and we need to see it that way and be flexible and see it as a medium rather than a specific tool that you must master and only use that one tool. Next is has to do with self-sufficiency. So I encourage, well, I don't encourage, all of my students, each one has a laptop. And for those that have money problems, we figure something out where they can either borrow one or buy something used, um, and they are in charge of maintaining and doing installation, updates, deleting, managing all their stuff. They have to handle their own IT on some personal level. And then on top of that, then we then say, okay, DIY, do it yourself. There's DIWO, which I stole from further field. I think they came up with that term. D-I-W-O is do it with others. So we also have to share our knowledge. We have to understand that the tech world is huge and complicated. And nobody can understand it all. So we need to help each other out. And so we do workshops uh, for each other internally on different, and students can decide what topics they're interested in. Somebody has a special interest in music. They do something with uh, LMMS or with Audacity or whatever and it works out pretty well and it actually it's interesting because then the students become personally invested in in these things once they are forced to explain them to other people and then another important approach is to say there's not a right way of doing things that you can actually do really cool things by using the tool wrong and you can make glitchy images you can hack things you can force one form of data into another and you can use trash aesthetics you can make illustrations using a spreadsheet um, you can sample and cut and paste so this is also something that where uh, open source really excels is letting you uh, tweak things and make them do something that maybe they weren't necessarily intended to do, but they give a cool visual result. So finally, the, 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 the general idea is that every designer is also a kind of inventor, that you have to invent your own technique or process, and that expression is something that is active. It's something that comes out of action, out of decisions that you take in the process of producing something. And the result is, is a record of that. So finally, how do I get away with it? That's sort of coming back to this idea of getting away with it. So how? 
I use these sort of limitations and constraints, but I say this is only temporary. After this is done, you can then, you don't have to do this again. You don't have to use this particular program or this medium or this way. It's, it's a way of saying like, this was a, a way to understand it, but now it's your choice. And because it's presented as a wide world of possibilities, then I think students don't feel as, as forced into using one program or another. And they feel like there's more diversity that's open to them. And in a way, the students start to like these constraints. They like to push against the rules, to play with this, that, okay, I'll make uh, an image with this, but then I'll cheat by, if I'm not supposed to use text, I'll use um, certain shapes that look like text. Um, and then there are just so many different ways of then combining things. That's another thing that is interesting. Instead of having one tool and doing one thing and one tool and that's done and it's a sort of autonomous work, then they they sort of mix and match and flow from one thing to the other. So they have more of a, um, at least at a certain point in their development of ideas, a more improvised process rather than something that's based on one tool and using it one way. And in the end, we have a lot of fun making cool stuff. And I think that's really the thing that's most convincing to anyone is if you can enjoy the process of using a piece of software and enjoy the result, that you're going to like it no matter who made it or how it was sold to you. So I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't or if you're feeling shy, go for it, try it. It's, it's actually been a, a big success. I've been doing this for five years. It was supposed to be one year and they've extended this and um, I'm still having fun and I'm really eager to hear about other experiences that people have teaching with floss. Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, I, I'm going to scroll back here. There are a couple of questions. So one about DIWO. Yeah, so there's an organization, an arts organization that does a lot of work with uh, the web and new media and stuff in the UK that's called Furtherfield. And that was where I first heard it, that they had a series of, uh, I think, basically workshops that they called DIWO as a sort of contrast, a sort of joke that that was sort of not the opposite, but a, like an alternative to DIY that it was collectively based. And that's something that I always do in the, in the, the, the second semester, each uh, the students have to make small groups and then um, uh, they give each other, they just sort of pick a topic. Sometimes it's a topic they don't know much about, but they're curious. Uh, like last year, there was one on DJing. They were interested in like beats uh, and DJ stuff. So they used mix and uh, did basically like a DJ workshop in the classroom. So I teach. Um, it's called uh, Foundations of Digital Communication. Sorry? Ah, uh, yes, to repeat the question was the, what, what's the actual course that I teach? So I teach, uh, it's in the Department of Visual Communication. So basically the, the profile for the students is, is graphic design and the course that I teach is called fun, uh, Fundamentals of Digital Communication. Um, uh, the other one, the, the sort of complementary course that's the analog media is called Foundations of, uh, of Artistic Techniques or something like that. But essentially, there, our courses are somewhat overlapping, but um, one is the more analog media and one is more digital. But uh, of course, we all know none of these things are really that easy to delineate. Okay, um, the other question, 
Oh, I'm glad you like the sign. Yeah, I borrowed that that from my son. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, he's five, so he's really into letters and stuff right now. So he likes to play with that. Um, my shirt, yeah. No, the presentation I actually recorded uh, like two days ago. So that's, yeah, I just changed my shirt for you guys. The age level. So this is university. It's the first year of university. And um, so my students are, some of them are coming straight from high school uh, in Germany. Usually you're like 18 or 19 when you graduate. I have had, I think once or twice students who were not quite 18 when they started the course, but I also have, it's, uh, it's not rare for students to either start studying something else or work for a few years or do some vocational training. So a lot of my students are maybe 25 and some are even in their 30s when they start studying this. But it is the first year of, uh, and it's a, it's a BA, uh, it's a four-year BA program. Yeah. Um, okay. So the question about how to survive with floss tools in industry. Um, that's the one that I, I realized that was part of where some of the, the pushback was coming is the students were like, yeah, but that's not what, that's not professional. And so um, I started to, to talk with them about that. And I, I guess the biggest example I showed them was that I showed them one, which was a, a job ad for an unpaid um, internship where they demand, they had this huge list of basically all of the popular commercial software. And then I had another one, which was for an art director who was you know, working on a pretty high level for a, a really big, corporation and that job had no references none to any particular software packages because what they were interested in were conceptual skills and um, personal skills and your ability to develop ideas it's this, it was assumed that uh, these kind of you know questions of whether you make the pixels or the vectors in this program or the other were irrelevant when you're working at that level so I, I use that to try and convince the students that the important thing is not that you got hip program or popular common programs listed on your resume. Everybody's going to have that. And the other thing is that these things change sometimes. Um, you know, there's a few that are very uh, established and, and they don't, you know, we know which ones they are. But there's also a few that are uh, they come and go, you know, like within five years, by the time you finish studying, a bunch of these companies are going to be bust or they're going to be bought up and then the products are going to be turned off. I mean, people who do 3D, you know, this is, is like every couple of years, something cool comes up and then a few years later, it then disappears from the market. So um, I try to convince them that what they need are sort of meta level skills and that they need an understanding if they have a good understanding of pixels when a new cool program comes out whether it's commercial or not they can use that um with the de facto tools uh all right wait hold on i'm, I'm looking at the i think i'm getting out of order here Do I ever have pushback? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it happens. And sometimes I have to be a little bit um, strict about it. But I also say, look, this is about artistic fundamentals. You don't, in, in the analog class, you don't complain uh, when you're using, I don't know. I mean, they have uh, ones where they're supposed to use like a giant paintbrush as a sort of restriction, as a sort of constraint to their creativity and they don't complain about the brand of paintbrushes or the type of things. And that's sort of one way that I try to argue is that I'm teaching you um, uh, meta level skills and that if you understand, um, you know, good rules of, of composition, of color, of um, 
different ways of doing layout, it doesn't really matter what particular tool you're using that you're going to be able to, if you have a general adaptability with software, because you used a lot of stuff and you're not uncomfortable about using something different, then it's not a big deal then to say, okay, uh, Quark Express isn't hip anymore, then I'm going to try this. I understand typography. This is typography. And that's, uh, to my mind, more important. And sometimes I have to push a little bit, but I, the way I've broken things down into small pieces, I say like, okay, we'll tell you what, next week, if you want, you can use the big commercial program. This week, you're going to use this one, but um, it's still typography or vector graphics or whatever. Um, you don't need to, uh, you know, feel like you're wasting your time. Um, okay. Do I, yeah, I teach half time. So the question was if I teach full time or not. Yeah, so I teach uh, half time and uh, I do some freelance stuff. It's kind of, it depends. I mean, I've done some, you know, more like very commercial stuff for, for startups, um, you know, either front end or other, you know, mostly front end uh, development for web based stuff. But also I do, at least my favorite work is I do for artists and museums, I do sort of technical things. So uh, video artists who need multi-channel installations or um, the, the German Railway Museum, one of my best customers, we really have fun building a lot of interactive uh, exhibits for them. And I do the, all that with, uh, with Floss. Wouldn't be possible without it. Okay. Uh, question. Are students curious about praxeology? Is praxeology something I teach? Why this name? Um, I don't know. I just, actually, I don't use the term that much in, I mean, I teach in German, so I would have to figure out what, if I could translate that even. Um, but uh, I do, I, I mean, I do like this idea that, that our practice is reflective, that it's about what tools we use and how, and that it's not just about, okay, these are the officially sanctioned tools. This is the way you produce images. It's sort of like, well, all right, here's a, a sort of an area that's interesting. How do you want to make it? It's up to you. That's part of your job as a designer is to think about the tools and the process. And, um, you know, that's, that's what makes it interesting. And that is also what makes the images, the results actually interesting. So I, I do incorporate that, that reflective aspect of it, of course. Yeah. How many weeks do I, um, my syllabus, it's two semesters. So, um, uh, the meta, yeah, the meta one is because <clears throat> it involves programming. That's sort of, um, it's one that well, I should repeat the question more explicitly. How many weeks do I teach the syllabus? And um, uh, this is from East. East also wants to know more about the meta, um, meta machines, I think was the, the part of the program. So yeah, that's um, our semester is I think 14 weeks and there's two semesters. So it's 28 weeks. So it's a year, basically one school year, um, two semesters <clears throat> that the, the program goes over. Um, and the meta machines, that one is more about dynamic stuff. So it depends on, on what we're doing. Um, so, I would say programming and I teach programming right now. I've done it with various different techniques. It was cool to see the, the presentation about, um, about Python and, and processing because I've been using processing in various different forms for a number of years. And lately I've been doing um, <clears throat> P5.js just because it's really, the online editor is really useful. Um, it's helpful to be able to, you know, when students run into trouble, they just send me a link to their code and then I can go and look at it. Um, and um, that's one of the tougher subjects, but it's also one of the subjects where people really start to see how cool Floss is. So 
Um, but I would say this meta machines thing, I wouldn't limit it to that. I would say even something like um, uh, you could even argue that using templating systems and CSS are kind of meta machine that you don't have uh, that as a designer, you come up with a system and then you pour the content into it and that will come out uh, differently. It's not that you lay out every little thing by hand the way you would in say a, a, a classic uh, page layout software. So I, I, I qualify that also as a sort of meta machine. Um, okay. What's the piece of software that my students choose to use the most? I think it varies. I mean, it, it also varies like depending on the year. I would say this year, a bunch of students are really into um, uh, Krita. Like they really like it. They, they did a big animation project with that and they had a lot of fun. They also had some trouble as it is, you know, especially with animation, you end up, um, huge files or conversion problems this kind of stuff is normal but uh that one is definitely big um i mean gimp is very popular just because it's a good general tool when you need to just quickly whip up something it's it really offers itself as the as the quick solution um but it's it's a huge variation and then i guess the one thing that everyone uses definitely a lot is a text editor. So, yeah. To uh, so question from myself himself. Uh, do you tie your classes with makerspace machines or techniques? 3D printing, laser cutting, vacuum forming, or am I focusing just on software and electronics? Yeah, for the most part, it's mostly software. The one thing I like to do is uh, we print a lot and we, we like to make, like the students, my students especially love making books. So like we did something recently where we were making uh, comics. And um, so uh, in terms of real physical stuff, printing is big. Uh, the other one that we do a lot is the plotter. So we have an axi draw and um, one of the first vector assignments is to then make some diagrams using axi draw. And that one's always a lot of fun and, and interesting um, to see what, what people do there. And also it's great because that works with Inkscape and it doesn't work so well with the commercial stuff, at least not directly. But uh, in terms of more, uh, yeah, like sort of 3D printing or laser cutting, we do usually do one workshop with the industrial designers every year um, where they work together. This year, we're going to do a combined workshop where we make uh, board games with the industrial designers. So we'll make teams where there's a couple of graphic designers or visual communicators from our department and then the um, the, uh, the the students from industrial design who then will help uh, you know making well not necessarily board games but uh, but tabletop physical real games um, yeah so we do but it's mostly in collaboration then how do students react with the change of formats the duality between open and closed formats um, I'm not sure I'm, I I mean they definitely see some advantages there. I mean, some of it is that they're very pragmatic. So, you know, and I encourage them also to do things like if somebody's having trouble making the perfect layout uh, just for like a, you know, showing work in progress, then I'll be like, well, just use an office program and slap your stuff in there. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can have a sort of a somewhat punk trash aesthetic maybe for this point in time. So, they they're ready to to improvise um and uh i guess for them they don't get so much into those debates although they do they start to see things uh with certain situations like um with copyright for example uh you know i i encourage them there's a lot of assignments where i say okay you can use appropriation but it needs to be from um, archive.org or something like that. So it's uh, we, we talk about a lot about 
copyright and also about the advantage of uh, things like the web where you can view source and how other formats like say flash or director they died because in part they weren't open enough that you couldn't uh, just go and, and sort of steal cool tricks from other people. Okay. Um, are many students interested in contributing? That's one I think maybe I need to work on more is getting them more involved in, in actually um, interacting with the, the floss community because I think that's one area where once people start doing that then they suddenly they can at least get really excited and they feel like it's a totally different thing. You know, a monolithic corporation versus uh, a community where you just show up in a, in a chat room and say like, hey, I'm having a problem with this. And then one of the main developers, you know, responds to you directly or something like that. I think that's a really, uh, it's a special thing that only Floss can offer you. Uh, maybe some really small commercial projects, um, but for the, the most part, um, you you don't get that, and and then I think it's something that you can also build on. That students, you know, feel like, wow, I actually had some influence. That it's actually a, a thing of uh, that exists in the social space, and it's not just a a product. You know, the sort of shiny bauble that you go to a store and you buy and uh, consume, and it either satisfies you or probably it doesn't after a certain amount of time and you throw it away and you buy a new one. I, I, I'm getting maybe a bit um, too political here. But yeah, um, definitely they, they, they do start to see in some contexts how this is interesting. Um, but I think I do need to maybe push my students to try to engage with the community more. All right. Um, okay. Are any of our activities, assignments documented somewhere for others to try and adapt in different contexts? Um, yeah, that is something I have been terrible about. My own notes are kind of like a mess of stuff. And I've only just started to, and in some ways, this whole viral situation has pushed me to be a bit tidier about that kind of stuff and to try and so I've started to make a website. I'm not ready to make it public, but um, I've been trying to uh, make it at least for the students. And then I think um, maybe in a month or so when I've got more of the material sort of edited and cleaned up that I can then um, publicize the URL and people can start to look at it because I really would like I, th I think it's it's stuff that maybe other people could use like I think I think that's Sam asking about uh, that because uh, I really like the for example you had an SVG uh, uh, demo that you did recently is gorgeous it's really nice and I showed it to a few students and they liked it and I think stuff along those lines could be really useful um, another question from myself himself. Do I feel that students sometimes miss basics in classical art history or lack art cultural knowledge? Um, yeah, not so much with, at least with my students, art history is fairly okay and I can sort of fill in the gaps there. Uh, what does seem to be missing is a certain amount of design history. So I, I try to show them a lot of examples um, especially when you get into things like vector graphics or typography or, you know, I've done assignments before where we say, okay, let's find, um, you know, let's find some Bauhaus 2D work and let's make it uh, in the web, you know, we'll figure out floats and we'll do a, a Mondrian. Okay, that's Pizzvat, that's not Bauhaus, but you know what I mean, this sort of classic stuff, some of it actually translates really well to uh, some of these either SVG or, or web formats. Um, so I try to fill things in there. But the one where I make a special effort in terms of uh, cultural knowledge is more the history of computing. So there's a lot of things like everyone knows about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and this sort of mythology. But to me, I feel like it's not 
it's not really accurate that the mythology that I think is maybe more inspiring and interesting is to look at um, well, first all the women who were involved in early computing, and so I'll show them, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I try to show them images and 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 talk about people who were involved in early computing who don't look like mm, heroic business executives, um, and uh, so we try to show that. Also, a lot of the the artists who were involved with experiments, you know, EAT and stuff in the '60s uh the experimenting with with media that i think those are useful backgrounds um in in uh in terms of cultural knowledge question from javier are all my students germans or do i have international students too does it change something yeah definitely i have uh yeah usually several international students every year um I mean, it, here in Germany, generally, if it's a bachelor program, it's still taught in German and I teach in German. So it does change things. And it's inter interesting. That's the one area also where open source uh, is doing a pretty good job. Like translations are good, you know, or, or things like like the the MDN, the uh, web, the docs from Mozilla are in most uh at least bigger languages that are really well translated. It's it's great stuff. So it does change things. And that's one area where um, open source can, at least for projects that are popular enough to have good translations, that students are like, oh, wow, cool. This, uh, you know, GIMP works in Korean. And it's, it's kind of exciting to people then to see that. Um, another question, is this still being taught in Corona times? doing video conferences. Yeah, I am, I will be honest, I kind of hate teaching online, even though I'm, I know it's ironic, I'm a sort of a digital person, I've been, I love the internet, I've been using it for, since I was like 16 and, uh, you know, way back in the 90s. Uh, but um, it's, it's hard and it's, I, I just really miss that classroom context so we're doing different things and I'm trying to experiment a little bit with um, instead of these for this do it with others thing, since we can't do workshops that are as hands on um, that I'm offering the students then to let them do some experiments with streaming. So whether they want to do play music or show videos and then we chat about them in parallel. We're trying some stuff like that and uh, right now we're doing stuff with with p5 js and using the online editor it's it's tough it really is because there's something about being able to sit down next to somebody uh, in front of a computer and, and look at things and talk about it that you you can't do uh, as well when you're you know miles away from each other Uh, Axie draw. Yes, Raphael, thank you for the link. That's right. That was the question about the plotter that we use, the pen plotter. It's a bit expensive, but it's pretty nice. But there are other ones. There are also ones that you can build yourself. Um, I, uh, yeah. So a question about how technically savvy are the incoming students? And did I notice a change in their willingness to accept Modifying or using digital tools differently? Okay, that's sort of two questions. Yeah, um, how technically savvy? That's, it really runs the gamut. And the interesting thing is I find the more they like mobile phones or the more, shall we say, uh, active they are in using their mobile phones, the worse they are technically, it's harder. Uh, the ones who are, in some ways, uh, who do really well are the ones who are more used to, they're coming from more of a PC culture, where they're used to sort of installing things and updating things and dealing with, I don't know, a driver problem or something like that. Whereas uh, with the mobile phone, all of the apps are generally, I mean, some of them are, you barely need to be literate. So they're kind of, uh, they don't expect you as a user to be able to, think for yourself that much so it's it's tougher you know some of them even 
I occasionally have students who have a hard time understanding files and what files are and how the file system works and where things are in their computer. Um, but sometimes I find it's very interesting that I'll have students who come in who are kind of, they've avoided dealing with PCs. Like they sort of have their mobile phone and they, they do that, but they're not heavy users. And they generally are, they love to draw and uh, paint and things like that, but they're a little bit wary of the, the computer as this sort of thing. And so they show a little bit too much respect, maybe. Um, uh, and they're afraid of sort of breaking things or doing something wrong. And so one of the things that helps is when we do uh, an assignment with glitch. And I'm like, yeah, you need to break your images. And you're going to need to try a lot of different ways. It won't look good or it'll look weird. It'll be the wrong spot. It's kind of experimental or breaking things. You can't really expect them to break in the way you plan. So this is one. And then there's other things that, that help them sort of loosen up and, and feel like, oh, OK, I don't have to understand everything completely. And I don't have to do things in uh, some sort of prescriptive, proper way. And some of these students end up being the ones who are actually, they get really excited. And they like uh, feeling the sense of a little bit of mastery, but also that they can play with stuff. And they end up going on to then be, uh, they started off as the least digital, and then on the end, two semesters they're uh, really into this stuff they become kind of nerdy um, so that's sort of one one story of, of, of what happens in terms of the how tech savvy they are um, and do I notice a change in their willingness to accept modifying or using digital tools I guess maybe that story answers your question I'm not sure if you want you can ask a follow-up and I, I can see so a question related to printing. I want to figure out a pipeline of flipbook making from Blender. Could processing, graphic layout, rendering to per frame, printing, maybe using GMIC. Uh, could I show you this someday? Sure. That sounds fun. That sounds like a cool concept. Yeah. And also the like a, a textbook case of, uh, yeah, how how floss tools uh, enable you to do something that's not conventional or, you know, expected, uh, but the flexibility is there, so you can just do it. Okay, Ada Lovelace, yeah, of course, but also people like more more recent um, Grace Hopper, uh, you know, who more or less gave us modern programming languages, you know, or Anne Hamilton, who is, uh, you know, the woman behind the uh, Apollo uh, computer, you know, and the students, most of my students don't know these people. Um, these women who are real pioneers and very important in the foundation of, of modern computing. Is that a toaster behind me, the silver object? No, it's, uh, this thing here is a, uh, like a lockbox. I mean, there's nothing valuable in it. It's just some pens. It's like an old um, thing that, yeah. OK. Um, OK, I think that was the last question, yeah? I mean, I can hang out in the chat if people want to talk more, but we can maybe, um, yeah. And I'm really, also, I, one last thing, I'm really curious to hear about other people. I know there's a lot of other people. I'm not the only one. I've only done this because I saw what other people had doing, what we're doing, and I was like, okay, maybe I can get away with it too. All right. Thank you.